Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, May 28th, 2019, Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show, and for our regulars, welcome back. Let's take a look at what's going on to start off this holiday shortened week. We've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 26 points, the S&P 500 up three and a half, the NASDAQ up 30, but uh, the Russell 2000 dropping slightly down a fraction uh, this morning was up earlier, but has pulled back and moved into negative territory. Ten-year Treasury yield down five and a half basis points now, 2.27 percent. A big breakdown on Friday in the three-month Treasury uh, note, and uh, that was the lowest we'd seen in a few months. And uh, to me, it's signaling that the market is looking for the Fed to cut rates rather than raise. Volatility index uh, moving up a little bit here, up about three and a half percent today with the market uh, fluctuating back and forth. Leading to the upside, the three groups that were leading about five, 10 minutes ago, all were aggressive groups, communication services, technology, and consumer discretionary, all higher on the day. Staples, you can see actually moving lower. I wrote a blog article about the staples this morning. Negative divergence in play, looking for some weakness. We're seeing a little bit of that today. Uh, in the uh, Among the industry groups, you can see the internet stocks leading the communication services group today to the upside. So far, balanced, ba <laughs> bouncing off of some lows that we saw uh, last week that were challenging the week before lows. Software moving higher, leading technology. But once again, and this has been a steady theme here over the past 30 days, semiconductors down again, despite the market trying to bounce back. You can see semiconductors uh, really struggling. AMD, however, leading again to the upside on a relative basis, announcing some new uh, computing and uh, graphics products. Uh, Intel suffering, though, in the other direction, down more than 2% today on that news. Intel also the worst performer in the Dow today. Okay, uh, Aaron, long weekend, short week this week, but uh, how was your Memorial Day weekend? It was quite nice. Very much enjoyed it. Pretty much took it easy most of the weekend. I We really didn't do much but uh, have our own personal barbecue yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, it's always a, a good weekend, obviously, to remember those uh, who sacrificed for us, um, giving us all these freedoms that we're able to enjoy every day. But, uh, you know, that is kind of the theme. I think most people probably enjoy getting out and barbecuing or coming out of winter. Got nice weather, although here in North Carolina, I got to tell or South Carolina, I got to tell you, it has been hot all of a sudden. <laughs> and if there's one complaint I have about this, the warmer weather here in the South is that at least in the few years that I've been down here, it seems like there's no spring. We go from cold, wet, winter, you know, 30s, 40s, rain, and then all of a sudden it's 98. <laughs> yeah, it's been cold here. I mean, for California, I mean, we had rain over the weekend, so there wasn't like you could do much, you know. And uh, today I think we're going to actually get up to 74, which is nice because it's been in the high 50s, low 60s, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> It's a little chilly. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got a lot to do, and I'm sure everybody doesn't need more of our weather report. <laughs> sure they do, but go ahead. All right. Upcoming schedule, Larry Williams is going to be with us tomorrow. Dan Russo from Chicken Analytics is going to be here Thursday. On uh, Friday, we're going to have the seasonality report by Tom. And then finally, uh, next week, Rick Ben Senior is going to be here on June 4th. So that'll be a great show as well. Today, we've got a packed agenda. We're going to start off with those Monday setups after technical news. I'm going to be doing a workshop on sifting scans. Uh, you may have seen that one before. I've updated it and made it even better. And then our 10 and 10 first symbol will be McDonald's. Hope you're loving it. And finally, we'll finish off with blog highlights. All right, Tom, let's do it. Technical news and headlines. All right. Well, let's start off with the economic reports out today. We had a couple in the housing area. Uh, the March case Shiller home price index came in with a slight rise, uh, one tenth of one percent market expecting two tenths. And then the house price index also rising one tenth of one percent and the market expecting three tenths. So a little disappointment there, but nothing huge. May consumer confidence out at 10 a.m. this morning, much better than expected, 134.1 versus 129.9. And if we take a look at how that uh, translated into action in the bond market, you can see the 10-year Treasury yield, as I mentioned, top of the show, really moving lower and quite a bit uh, lower after bouncing 
at that 2.36% level, you can see we could not get through the declining 20 day moving average. And when we look back over the past six months or so, that's generally been an area with a few exceptions. It's generally been an area where we have struggled and all the sellers and treasuries tend to disappear at that level. The buyers jump back in and as a result, send yields lower. The last four days, as you can see, dropping from about 2.44% at the high to now below 2.30%. Uh, that is well, can be problematic. And I think is sending some messages to the Fed. Don't know if they're listening, but also pull up here the uh, three month Treasury uh, yield and take a look here. You see these two bottoms back in November and then again in January at about 2.37%. We exploded down below that level on Friday. This is this represents Friday's close at 2.35%. That is problematic because in the near term, it's, yeah, I think it's beginning to send a really clear message to the Fed that uh, the bond market wants a rate cut before a rate hike. So we will see if the Fed continues to pay attention. As far as earnings go, still a couple of earnings reports coming out, at least uh, some to, to keep an eye out. We got a couple of big ones, or one big one after the bell today. But uh, first, let's go into the ones that reported this morning. You can see Bank of Nova Scotia. Coming in a little light, Booz Allen Hamilton, better than expected. Same with Momo. And then Anaplan, that was actually a really good report. We're getting a break out there. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to take a look at the, a chart at that in just one second. But first, before we get into any of those earnings reports, I wanted to pull up and show you a chart on Advanced Micro. So Advanced Micro comes out, and uh, they announced new computing and graphics products. And you can see the market's reaction here. I think the stock market's really liking it, almost $29, trying to break out to a new high. Talked about this one last week. On a relative basis, it broke out to a multi-month high prior to this move up today. And that just tells me that despite the semiconductors moving down, the same feeling uh, isn't shared about AMD. AMD has actually been a very, very good relative performer going sideways in a group that has been going straight down. So that was a pretty good relative strength signal. Now we're getting some news to come out to support it. I look for the stock to make this break out above 30. Mentioned it before, I believe that uh, AMD is going to go back up and hit this 33, 34 level and eventually break out to the upside. I still think AMD is one of the better performers, not only in the semis, but overall in the market. You can see relative to the S&P 500, it is also making a multi-month breakout despite being part of a group that's been horrendous. So as I said last week, I would just simply watch this 26 area. I think as long as AMD holds 26, I don't care what the group is doing. This has been a relative leader. I suspect we're going to see some more gains ahead in AMD. Speaking of this, this group, uh, we'll take a look at the other stock, the other big one in the group, Intel. And Intel, while AMD has been holding up great, look at Intel. Intel actually has been struggling relative to the group. Got a little bit of a relative bounce over the past couple of weeks, but you can see the overall downtrend in play. Uh, Intel has been one of the weaker performers. Look at all the volume coming in on the selling. Hopefully, when you look at these two stocks, AMD and Intel, side by side, you can see AMD is the one that's loved. Intel, not so much. All right. Uh, mentioned a couple of earnings reports. I do want to bring up Plan, P-L-A-N, Anna Plan. Look at the breakout here. It's part of the software group, and this is a group that I say you want to continue to be part of, uh, whether it's Anaplan or some of the others. My uh, Monday setup, which I'll talk about in just a couple minutes, is from this software group this week. And I think some of these software st uh, stocks are still poised to go up quite a bit. When we look at the relative strength, software continues to be very, very strong relative to the S&P 500. Speaking of relative strength, uh, there are a couple of areas in financials that have continued to perform well. Just want to go over these very quickly. Specialty finance continues to hold above its 50-day moving average, up 1.6% today, continuing to push higher and uh, trading very strongly on a relative basis. Then we can go into the DJUSSF, which is consumer finance. Look at this group trying to make a breakout to a new high. Very strong uptrend. You've got a leader here. And then the last one was the financial administration stocks getting a lift today from a $21.5 billion uh, merger between global payments and total systems. Uh, that's GPN and TSS. And you can see financial administration stocks 
continue to be doing well as well. All right, we're going to move on. We've got a little different schedule today, and we want to get into the Monday setups. We know it's Tuesday, but uh, Monday setups is something we do at the beginning of every week since we had the holiday yesterday. We are going to jump in. Here are last week's Monday setups. Aaron, you definitely uh, beat me. I think the audience may have may have won. Yes, and you know, honestly, if we took out today's trading, I think I would have won. But you know, <laughs> I ended up with the right now. I think mine's down like over one percent, and the audience's Mastercard is up over two percent, at least the last time I looked. So, yeah, and mine is well. Let's just skip mine. <laughs> it just didn't work out so well. Yeah. Well, actually, when I talked about it last week, I did say that uh, forty-four was like a second entry. And the stock did continue moving lower. But even when the markets bounced, the stock has not bounced. So it was down at 44.24. I think it's down a couple bucks, which is, I don't know, four point something percent. So not a very good week. I would say this, though. It is in a group that uh, the uh, industrial machinery group that has been really under pressure over the last week, along with semiconductors and some of the like apparel retailers. These are groups that have been getting hit hard uh, regarding the, the trade talk. And so I would just make sure if you're in those groups, Keep your stops in play and uh, and don't make excuses because these stocks are getting hit hard on a relative basis. All right, uh, so we're only good at, as good or as bad, in my case, as our latest picks. So what do you have for this week? All right, let's see here. Let me get my uh, trusty to, <laughs> my trusty uh, screen here ready. So I picked six. Um, these are them on the. RRG, they're kind of all over the place and you can see they need to start improving, but most of these are starting to move up. Uh, at and looking pretty good there on the RRG. So let me go ahead and, and I did want to point out that notice I have, I ended up with four real estate REITs, um, a specialty and residential. Uh, I think that this is going to be the area coming up right now. I think there's still a lot of instability in the market. And I think real estate's going to be uh, a sector that will work out. And I think my PMO scan is uh, telling me the same. So let us go ahead and look at these charts. Let's see. Yeah, we'll start off. Actually, I'm going to start off with equity residential property trust. Uh, one of the things I'm noticing on the REITs, and you'll probably see it on most of them, are... Um, ascending triangles. And these are bullish patterns. And in the case of EQR, today it's managed to penetrate that uh, resistance line formed by the top of the triangle. Got a PMO buy signal. Uh, I've really liked the volume patterns on the OBV for most of these REITs. You can see that it's been really doing well. You know, even when you have the, the rallies, and maybe this is not going to be as go to performer since it's somewhat in a defensive area, you can still see it really held up nicely as far as the scooter. So I think that EQR looks pretty good as one of the REITs I have. H Healthcare Trust of America is a specialty REIT. Now in this case, we don't have the triangle pattern, but what I see is we had this decline coming in and, and then we formed really a double bottom. We've had the confirmation already. It's broken out. I would have liked to have seen this one a little bit sooner in my scans, but I just, you know, it didn't come up. But you can see 2050 has got a positive crossover, PMO on the buy signal, and again, really nice volume on the OBV and the improvement in the scooter looks really good here. If we draw, if we annotate here, you can see that right there at that top back in April, we're just now trading at it or just above. So we're getting the breakout. If you want to do the, <clears throat> excuse me, if you want to do the measurement on the double bottom pattern, well, it looks like it's about one, two, three, four, five and a half. So we still have uh, at least, I would say at least 50 cents more to the upside if we get the breakout um, just to fulfill the, the minimum, <clears throat> excuse me, the minimum upside target for HTA. So I thought that one looks pretty good. Uh, the next one up is going to be LTC Properties. And again, another REIT. And here is a, a really nice breakout going on here. Look at that. That is just beautiful. It actually happened on uh, Friday, 
And now we're getting the move to the upside intraday. And now we're coming back down to test that breakout point. You could even draw in the rising bottoms here. There we are. Oops, didn't want to do it that way. Uh, so you have that triangle pattern again, if you look here. See, flat top, rising bottoms, uh, and, nice, and a really nice breakout. If you do the measurement here, uh, that's quite a bit for it to move up past here. So I think that uh, LTC looks pretty good. All right, let's go on a different path here. Let's look at Merck. This was my only healthcare one that came out. And, you know, I like the PMO buy signal. It was in uh, oversold territory. The PMO is now hit above zero. So that tells me that there's um, some really good staying power right now on that momentum. You know, you, you want to see the oscillation of the PMO above the zero line because that is usually consistent with rallies. Uh, we, we, did not have that. We had that really deep decline in April, but it looks like we're coming back out. Nice little breakout here. Resistance is at 84. So, I mean, there's still an opportunity here to get, um, you know, a pretty nice um, move to the upside to 84, but that is your, your spot that you might want to keep in mind as a target. All right. AT&T was one of the ones I put in the poll for you. And I, I like this one. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm like super happy with it, but I wanted to get something in the comm sector because I think that's also going to be a place that we're going to find some strength. So I'm looking at the top back here from October. Uh, you managed to get that. It had a really great rally, popped up above it, um, but then it immediately failed. But I think you could make a case for a flag here. And let's make it fat. There we go. So there's your poll. And there is your flag right there. And so if we do get the breakout uh, above this flag, or especially if we get above this area of overhead resistance, I think there's, there's some upside potential here if we're looking at uh, if this truly is going to be a flag formation. But we haven't had the breakout, so it's not uh, confirmed just yet. But I thought that one looked pretty good. And then my pick is going to be Avalon Bay communities. And this one just popped right in. I mean, it was like one of the first ones that came in from my scan. Hang on. Whoops. I didn't want to do that. Just trying to get that a little bit wider for us. There we go. Uh, I, this one popped up on the top of the scan, of course, AVB. Uh, and I saw the ascending triangle. I saw the breakout from it. Uh, it even broke out above the 205 area. We've got the PMO buy signal. And look at all the room it has to travel higher. And look at the OBV. Really nice. Ever since that uh, bottom back in December, there's really been no let up on the positive volume. And then the scooter. You've got a really strong scooter here for Avalon Bay all the way back uh, almost a year. So I, it's a strong candidate. I think it's a great breakout. Uh, this is going to be my pick this week at 205.71. Okay, uh, so you're going to stick with real estate. I like real estate breaking out too, but I'm, I think this is going to be a week of the aggressive stocks. I think we're starting to see a little bit of that already today. So I'm going to take it in a little different direction. I really like the software group. Um, it seems like one after another uh, continuing to make breakouts. And I think right now Smartsheet uh, is one that is just starting to, to show a lot of uh, accumulation. Um, if you look back here over the last two weeks or so, a lot of hollow candles, volume picking up. Today's volume really strong as we make this move up. This is the, the, the highest that uh, Smartsheet has seen since it came out with its earnings back in March. It's going to be reporting again in a couple weeks. I think this is a pre-earnings run that we're starting here on Smartsheet. I like it. I own it, uh, just full disclosure. Um, but I think this is going to make a run up for $48, $49. Hopefully, it makes it before earnings. Um, but uh, I do think Smartsheet's going higher. So this is going to be my pick. Forty-three ninety-one dollars um, is the price. So I will go with that at this level. And then as far as uh, some of the other picks that I have, uh, this is in the poll. And then the other one that I put into the poll was Chipotle. And I actually think that we're in sideways consolidation here. I know Chipotle had some bad news last week. The, the African swine flu, uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, the news headlines are one thing, but the charts are quite a different story. I believe that Chipotle, after 
uh, coming out here with its earnings report. It had already had tremendous uh, or tremendously bullish uh, results already built into the price of the stock. So when the news came out on its earnings, it didn't get the breakout. A lot of folks said, OK, time to take the uh, profits, ring the register. We came down and set a pretty important low around 655 or so intraday. Went all the way back up, tried to make a breakout, didn't quite get there, didn't didn't get the breakout, and now we came right back down to the bottom of this range. I see a reversal taking place here. I think CMG is going to make another run for 720, 725. So those are the two picks I have for the poll, and then a couple of others. You know, one thing that uh, I know my pick for last week, TKR, was horrible, but uh, I will say that I had one last week in my other picks that turned out to be a monster. A-R-R-Y. It's in the bio, uh, biotech area. The stock was up probably close to 30% last week. Um, huge day last Tuesday. Uh, of course, I didn't pick this one for my setup. Uh, that never works out quite that that uh, way. But A-R-R-Y did have a good strong week. I'm going to pick another biotech this week. This one is not in my strong earnings chart list. So, um, But it was one that I had, been, that I had put into a separate folder that I was just kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. See this gap up? They came out with a product announcement. Uh, the FDA had approved. Stock had gapped up from about 715 all the way up to 12 something that day. And this is why it really il illustrates why you don't want to chase these moves when you come out with news. I mean, I know it's just a thing to do. Everybody's excited. Look at this stock. It gaps up to 12 and a quarter. Here we are two months later. We're back to where we gapped up from all the way back down seven and a quarter. So I like it here. I don't like it at 12 and a quarter, but I definitely like it here. This is where we were prior to the news. Now we've got the news in our back pocket. We already know that they've gotten their approval. Maybe there's some other bad news coming down the road, but I think that the reward to risk on this stock is a whole lot better. Now it is a biotech. Who knows? This thing could come out with news and be at $5 tomorrow. So position size accordingly. But this, it also is one that I think could announce a partnership with someone. It's a small company. So if all of a sudden they get uh, an announcement with a big pharma company, that could be the next announcement where we see a big pop in the stock. Again, I have no idea when we might see something like that. It's just a pure conjecture on my part. But I think that now that we're back at this gap support level, this is one to at least consider. Very, very, very aggressive pick. Just want to make sure everyone understands that couple of others, and uh, these are off of my strong earnings chart list. These are stocks that have pulled back quite a bit recently, but still have really high scooters, at least 80, 85 or above. Lattice Semiconductor, huge volume, big move up. I think this is a stock that is consolidating much the way that CMG is consolidating. You can see that right across here, just above $11, good support. Uh, the stock was up to 15 less than a month ago, and now here we are back down at 12. I like the reward to risk. CDNS, another one that had had a huge run up this year, has pulled back, but right near gap support, price support. I think as long as $63 holds on this stock, I like it. Recent highs up near 70, got almost 10% upside, very little downside. And then the last one I have is eBay. This one, it's on my strong earnings chart list. Really like the fact that it keeps holding this 35 and a half to $36 level. We just challenged that the last couple of days, starting to show a bounce here. Moving back up above those moving averages would be bullish. All right, let's go ahead and summarize our picks for today, for this week. And um, you will see that uh, Aaron went with AVB, and I went with uh, Smartsheet, S-M-A-R. And there you have it. All righty. So we are now going to move into your workshop, Aaron, and uh, looking forward to it. Oh, thank you. Uh, it is a popular topic. I get a lot of questions about it, which is my scanning. But what do you do when you get the scan results? Uh, well, that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to explain how I like to sift my scans. And hopefully it'll give you some uh, you know, pointers on how to sift your scans. I'm, of course, going to be using my indicators. So, you know, you can keep that in mind. Uh, I, of course, think that's the best way to make your picks. <laughs> and the scan is to use the price momentum oscillator, the PMO. Uh, so I will be using that and you'll get a chance to see that as well. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to be doing a lot more uh, looks at uh, 
the process. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through some of the basics first and then we'll go and watch it in action. So the first thing I would say is you need to create a candle glance chart style. It's kind of the number one thing because to me, if you're gonna sift your scans, when you have like, I don't know, 45 to 80 results, and you know, personally, I don't wanna go through each chart. Uh, I wanna be able to see everything just enough and be able to um, delete it. So you can do the 10 per page, but again, that's still too much information for me at once. I like to use my candle glance. So I set up my candle glance the way that uh, I want it in terms of what moving averages are there, what it looks like, I've got the PMO on it. I'll go through that really quickly when we get there. But I think that's very important so that you can see what you need to see. Uh, I recommend that you create a scan dump chart list or you can name it whatever you want, but make it a transient list that you can drop your scans in and you, know, you can sort in there. And then once you get the ones you want, then you can move that into a more permanent watch list or other chart list. But I think it's really helpful, and I learned this from Greg Schnell, so I'm gonna give him kudos to have this. It saves so much time, and it's, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, you know, saved to a new chart list is what people do, and then you end up with, you know, 50 chart lists of scan results you've had over the past five days. So I recommend that transient chart list. Be sure before you even start, understand what you're looking for, based on your scan. I know that sounds uh, kind of silly and, and most people would, would you know, keep that in mind, but you know, time frame could make a difference. Um, you know, the, the settings of your momentum oscillators can make a difference. You wanna know really what you're looking for. And I'll go through my scan briefly, but to give you an idea. And, and again, so you need to know what kind of results you're gonna get just based on the scan that you have. And then you really, uh, it's important, I think, to know how to manipulate it because some days you might get 200 um, scan results and you wanna pare those down, or maybe you only get 10 and you wanna make, uh, you wanna widen the universe and manipulate the scan so you get more results. So I think it's important to understand how to manipulate the scans as well so that you get the kind of results uh, you, you want. You wanna have enough uh, to look at, uh, to go through. And then finally, I think of course, before you even hit the run scan button, you need to know what your market environment is. So in a big picture sense, do you have a bull or bear bias? What does that mean for sector rotation? For example, today when I ran my Monday setup scan, I ended up with mostly REITs um, that came in and bonds. Uh, and that tells me that we're in a market with kind of a bearish bias. There's some uncertainty going on there. So I should understand that when I get these results, number one, what it means, and number two, um, what I wanna do with those based on the big picture. Does it make sense to go into a defensive sector just because my scan came out? Or do I want to look at, you need to look at the market in general, because if it looks like you're getting ready for a nice bull run, uh, a, a great uh, rally to the upside, you may not want to be in a utility or, or in uh, a REIT. It's just, you know, or a bond fund for that matter. All right. So what do we look for when we're going through the scans? Uh, I look for, um, First of all, like I said, we adjust it to make sure we get the kind of results we want. I look for good PMO configurations. I think it's important to see very quickly what support and resistance levels are. I want to know what the moving average configuration is. Is the 20 rising? Is the 50 uh, rising, but the 20 is moving you know, down? What's, what does that tell me as far as support and resistance as well? You can use moving averages for that. And then look for prominent chart patterns. Look for those chart patterns that um, will come to your attention in a candle glance chart. I think that's one of the best parts of candle glance. I can immediately see um, chart patterns. It's really easy for me to um, pick those out. So what is a good PMO configuration? We're supposed to look for that, right? Uh, I would say, first of all, I want it to be oversold, so either turning up in that very bottom of the, of the range, 
or I want it to be just above the zero line, just getting into that strength um, of momentum or turning up just above the zero line. That tells me you've got a stock that's been oscillating above the zero line with, their, uh, with the PMO, and that implies uh, internal strength. So if you find one that's turning up just above the zero line and it's had this really nice uh, oscillation above that line, those are usually good configurations to look at. Uh, looking for PMOs that are turning up. Um, I will accept a moving or flat PMO if I'm looking at a nice rising trend because the PMO will flatten out uh, if acceleration doesn't change. So if you're on a very nice pathway to the upside and you'll usually, usually see that with some of those bond funds, they just move very, very slowly to the upside. Uh, that means you're gonna get a flat PMO. Uh, because that acceleration isn't changing. So I will accept a PMO that is moving flat if it's with a rising trend and not a declining trend, of course. We want to have plenty of overhead travel territory. So just because you've got this PMO that looks great and it's turning up, if it's near the top of its range, um, that means that 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 stock is overbought and momentum is now overbought and it is turning up, but you might have, uh, might be time for that pullback. So I, I prefer to have plenty of room for the PMO to travel to the upside. Doesn't mean that if you picked one that's overbought uh, and rising that it's not gonna continue to rise, but I, I, wanna have, uh, I wanna have it at the beginning of the move or maybe just going into that move to the upside. Uh, I like to look for bullish confirmations or positive divergences with the PMO, but I don't put as much uh, emphasis on divergences with the PMO. Uh, it's, it's just a personal preference. You can do it. Uh, I just find that certain divergences on the PMO don't always mean what you think they should mean. Uh, I think confirmations, honestly, are a little bit more positive uh, at this point rather than looking for divergences. I want to see rising bottoms on the PMO and rising bottoms on price. Support and resistance level. I think most of us can, can identify resistance and support lines, but you know, where is the highest price for the period that you're looking at on your candle glance? Where is the support level? Are, is price near that? Uh, is it near resistance? Well, if it's near resistance, I still might want to put it on a watch list if the PMO is rising and looking good. Uh, look for trading ranges and prices at the bottom of trading ranges or those rising trends. And those will also help you with determining where your support and resistance levels are. Moving average support or resistance, of course, you can use those as well uh, to determine your support and resistance levels. But it, it's important, and you can see it on a candle glance, because I'm going to run through it, and you'll see um, that you can see these things. Prominent chart patterns, I figured I would just give you the list of some of the most popular uh, bullish chart patterns. Of course, if you're looking for a shorting opportunity, you're not going to want to see these patterns. But typically, we're looking uh, not to short, we're looking to buy. So these are the bullish chart patterns I recommend looking for. The ascending triangle today, as I ran through our Monday setups with all those REITs showing up, almost every one of them had an ascending triangle uh, bullish formation. So again, told me to concentrate in that area. Double bottom, triple bottoms, those are pretty obvious, but look for those after a Tr declining trend. These are not going to be as useful to you if you've got a rising trend and then you get the double bottom. Um, it's supposed to, it's a reversal pattern. So you need to come down into a, a, either the triple bottom or go down into that double bottom. Reverse head and shoulders. And again, same thing. Best to look for a reverse head and shoulders off of a decline. Uh, they are reversal patterns. Not to say they don't work if if you uh, look at them uh, the other way to each his own. Uh, declining wedge, that's also a, a positive pattern. I think right now, um, you know, we've been looking at a lot of rising wedges in the major markets and uh, that's a bearish pattern. Obviously declining wedges uh, are the ones you want to look for for the bullish side of things. All right. And let's go through the steps, and then we're just going to go right on over to uh, the website, and I'm going to run through the steps. We'll go 
one by one here. So of course, once you've got all of your stuff set up, your candle glance and all of that, you understand your scan, obviously then it's time to run it. Um, I save it, like I said, to a scan dump or a transient chart list. I then view it in candle glance. And remember, I've already set up my candle glance to be what I want to see all of my indicators and moving averages. I want to see it in my set, in my uh, chart format, not in the default uh, chart format. So I created a candle glance. Once you're there, there's a little trash cam button. And if it just doesn't appeal to you for any reason, just hit, the, hit that uh, trash can and just keep going. Uh, sometimes maybe you'll see one, you'll go, oh, I like that. I don't need to, I'm just going to write that down because I know I'm going to want it. Um, but you can also go through and just click, 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 delete the ones you don't like, and then that'll help you um, narrow it down. And then once you have the ones you want, like today when I came up with my Monday setups, I saved them into my Monday setups chart list. So sounds easy enough, right? So let's go ahead and uh, let's go and look at how this all will work in real time. All right, so number one, we need to create a candle glance chart style. All right, let's just pull up, uh, we'll pull up Avalon Bay. All right. All right. So I need to have a good candle glance chart style. I don't want to use the default. So I am going to go down here and I'm going to cheat a little bit because I already have set up my chart styles. But I have a couple of different candle glances. My primary candle glance looks like this. It is a um, fill the chart two bar um, extra on the end. Uh, this is the setup. It gives me 20, 50, 200 day moving averages, and it gives me the PMO on the bottom. And I just did the color because it tells me that it's my, my candle glance and not anybody else's. So I've set it up the way I want it. And then I should save that to be candle glance. And there it is. So that's, it's saved as candle glance. Like I said, I usually have a couple here uh, just I like to have an intraday one uh, or a shorter term one, like you can see there. But today we're going to use my, my regular one, 20, 50, 200, and there's the PMO. So I have my candle glance set up now. Next thing is I want to have that transient chart list set up, which I already do right there. Okay, next thing I need to know is understanding my scan. So let's go ahead and we'll go to the scan. And I have quite a few, but I did just recently write in Chart Watchers, not this last weekend, but the weekend before. I wrote about my favorite scan right now. Uh, so I'm going to use that one, but I have a bunch of other ones. I have everything from a scan um, for you know shorts. Uh, I've got the ones for my trend models. I've come up with a few uh, you know, for our segments on Market Watchers Live. Um, but this is the new one that I'm really kind of liking right now. I think that's the one. Let's just go to edit and make sure that's the right one. Yes. All right, so if you're interested in my scans or uh, this recent one, if you do a, a search generally on um, Aaron and scan in quotation, uh, you should come up with go. You're going to end up getting go to the blog articles and well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, let's just do it this way, Aaron Swenlin. And then we'll do scan. There we go. So here's that article I just wrote. Uh, there's the technical scans that I do a lot of times on our show. You can go back and find the show I did it for and watch it. Um, and, and I just have, you know, a bunch of different scanning in there. So uh, enjoy that. But let's go back to what we were doing. All right, here's that new scan that I like. So got to understand what I'm scanning for. Um, I'm using, um, in this case, oh, that's an example. Where's, where's the one? That's the one. 
Okay, so I'm looking for a stock in the US. Uh, that's my daily volume that I want. So I'm looking for something with a average volume above 100,000. I wanna keep those penny stocks out. So I have it cl a close above $10. And I have a PMO that's rising for three days right here. This is where I usually can, can expand my results. Um, I can just take out uh, some of these comments. I can say, well, rather than having risen for three days, I'll accept it's been rising for two days. And that will open up your scan. This tells me I want the 20 above the 50, above the 200. So I want a positive setup of the EMAs. This would be another place where I could expand my results by commenting out, for example, the 50 day being above the 200 day. I can just take that out. And then I'm looking for a scooter between 70 and 80. Uh, I want one that's on the, on the rise, that's in a, that mid range, but has room to become even stronger. So let's go ahead and we'll run this. And I think I ended up with like 40 something results when I ran it this morning. Okay, we actually had a few more. So I'm going to replace a chart list. And I, let me show you this first. So if you store it in a new chart list, that's when you end up with chart list after chart list after chart list every time you do a scan. So that's why I like to um, replace the results um, that way. So let's get this. Okay, I want to not do that. I wanna do this and we're gonna put it in the scan dump right there. Okay. And now I want to view this in, ta-da, candle glance. And there it is. That's my setup uh, that I have for my candle glance. So I get to see the PMO. I get to see the 20, 50, and 200-day EMAs. So now it's time to start paring things down, okay? So I'm going to look first um, for PMOs that uh, don't look interesting to me because they're a little too high in their, um, in their range. Okay, so for example, this one's near the top of a range, so I don't want that one, so I'm just gonna take that out. Uh, this one's on a nice ride, but you, again, the PMO is getting overbought. So while this still might be a good choice, um, I want something that hasn't been on the run for so long. I'm gonna look for something better. Uh, let's see, those look pretty good. That looks like the PMO's trying to top right now, so I'm gonna take that one out. Let's see, that looks good. Those are all still looking good. That's overbought and looks like it's rounding out. So I'm gonna take that one out. That looks okay. That's flat, but we're on a nice rise. I happen to know, I'm pretty sure that's a bond fund. So that's gonna be a slow mover. So maybe I won't want it, but for now I'm just gonna leave it. Uh, that PMO looks like it might be topping. So we'll take that out. Uh, and then next, so we'll see how far we've gotten this pared down just by looking at PMOs. That looks good. That does look like it's decelerating. I'm gonna take that out. Uh, that looks good. That looks good. That one is decelerating and near the top of a range. That one's been flat. Uh, it's getting near overhead resistance. So I'm, I'm gonna just take that one out at this point. Um, that looks like one of those bond funds that moves too slow. Uh, that looks like a good PMO. I can accept that one and that one. Uh, let's see, those. that one looks like it's decelerating and turning down, so I don't want that one. That looks like it's moving, turning uh, into a, yeah, it's flattening out. It may even top below the signal line, so we'll, we'll take that one out too. All right, so now we're down to how many? We started with 49, and now, well, it's not telling me exactly, but I know we're at quite a bit less. So that was one of the things we look for. What's the next thing I look for would be uh, support and resistance level. So let's see where price is in regards to that. So this one is sitting right on it. Uh, it needs to burst above it. I would keep this one because the PMO is turning up just above the zero line. And even though it's at overhead resistance, it's really set up for the breakout. So I would leave this one in based on support and resistance. This one has moved itself above overhead resistance, broke out, coming back and testing. I like it. Uh, this one looks like, as far as support and resistance goes, it's hitting some resistance now, but it, it, it has gotten above previous overhead resistance. I'll leave it. 
Uh, this one got near overhead resistance and has turned down. That actually looks like a rising wedge, which I happen to know is a, a bearish pattern. So I'm going to take that one out. And this one's moving sideways. It's kind of in between on a trading range. Uh, if it were at the bottom of the trading range, I might take it. Uh, that's a nice breakout above resistance. Nice little breakout. Again, this looks like a slow mover bond fund. I'm going to take that one out. Take that there too. Chubb. Hmm. Kind of near the top of the range. I sort of missed out on that as far as the PMO. So I'm going to take that out just based on that. This is reaching overhead resistance. Uh, I might leave this one just for the watch list, but with a, it reaching overhead resistance, I'll, I'll keep it because I like the PMO turning up above zero. And I think there's a good chance we might get that breakout. If I happen to look at this one, there we go, declining tops and a breakout. Very nice, getting ready to hit this, uh, what could be a confirmation on a kind of a messy double bottom. Uh, so that's good. And look at the PMO is rising. So we're we're getting these down. Uh, that looks like a bond fund. I don't want it. So you can just keep going through. That was support and resistance. Uh, let's see a little bit more here. The next thing I usually look for is that moving average configuration and chart patterns. So we already know that the EMAs are going to be configured well because of the way I did my scan. So that's why it's important to understand your scan. So I already know that these EMAs are gonna be set up nicely, but it's good to look at where price is and what the EMAs are doing. For example, HTA just had a 20, 50 day um, positive crossover. It's breaking out. This actually was one of my Monday setup picks. Um, it had the double bottom here and it's moved above that confirmation line and broken out. Uh, so I think uh, HTA looks good just based on that. So I could either write that down and then add it to a chart list or um, or I could just keep moving down, you know, keep deleting, keep deleting. So this looks like that's a spider fund. I'm going to just take that out. These I know are bond funds. So I'm going to leave those out. In fact, if we just go to edit the list, let's see, there's a bond fund. I just, I know that I don't want that limited liability partnership, not interested, bond, bond. And there's another one and there's one. So I'm gonna take those out and where are we now? We're down to 23 and we've done this in what, 10 minutes, um, maybe? Uh, this is the way you can quickly do this. It's just, I can't uh, recommend enough using candle glance. I just think that it is absolutely the best way to see all of your stocks and quickly on a scan find what looks the best. So we were looking for chart patterns and we're looking at 20, 50 day crossovers. So there's that one. This one, the 20 could be getting ready to cross below the 50, uh, which I'm not very happy about. Um, I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Like I said, delete freely. Why not? There's all these other choices. Um, you know, th there's no point in continuing that. So here's a chart pattern that looks like a ascending triangle there, flat top, rising bottoms. Uh, the expectation is a breakout to the top. So I think that still looks pretty good. Uh, 20, 50 day EMA positive crossover. Uh, you can see all of these REITs really looking good right now. And uh, you can just keep th going through there. So we've, we've gotten it down pretty far. Uh, now, how do I pick my Monday setups when I still have this many? Uh, I look for the PMO buy signals and a 20 moving up like we see here. The ones I ended up picking today, let's see if they're still in here. They should be. Avalon Bay was one of them. Again, nice ascending triangle with the breakout. And then when you look at the chart even, you can see that it's pulling back toward that breakout point. So really nice entry even right here. And what else did I end up picking? EQR, and that's still here. Another ascending triangle, flat top. Hasn't quite managed to break out above that uh, overhead resistance, but certainly worth a watch with the PMO buy signal just coming in. LTC, did I get rid of that? No. Good to know I'm, when I follow this, it, it does go. There, there's another ascending triangle, flat top, rising bottoms, and a breakout. So another 
good looking chart right there. Merck was another one and that's still in here. That's a flag formation. Looks like a flag breakout and continuing up. Nice uh, PMO moving into the positive zone. There's a 2050 positive crossover. And then I think the other one, yep, AT&T flag formation. Not my favorite one of the of the group, but those were the ones I ended up picking for my Monday setups. So really that is uh, the main thing I wanted to talk to you about as far as sifting scans go. Uh, I hope this is helpful to you on your sifting scans, but really I think critical at this point is get your candle glance set up, get a scan dump set up and that way you can have that scan ready to go. Copy some of my scans if you don't know where to start. Another great place to start are the predefined scans. And I'll go take us to that on the home page here. Predefined scans, this is an excellent place to go to either build a scan or just use one of these scans. You can even look uh, based on the part in the market so you can set that up, just hit that and you're gonna get um, the results. And then here, up here in the corner, you can edit it. And this is how you can just borrow, you know, the code. So if you wanna use this code, but match it up with maybe some of your other scans, like I have my general PMO scan, uh, you know, you can copy paste and, and there you go. Now you've created your own scan, maybe even a hybrid one, just based on what scans we already have uh, in there. So again, that concludes it. I hope this was helpful for you. And uh, I'm feeling pretty good about that one. Tom, do, do you ever use the candle glance? Um, well, I use it for the market update. Um, That's true. Yep, every day on the show. Um, personally, I usually use the summary. I have a lot of my own personal, you know, my stocks in a chart list. And so I normally have so many. Um, and I normally will zero in based on whether they're up or down for the day. So I like to use the, the summary page, which you can then uh, sort. And uh, so I use the sort function based on percentage change. And I can quickly find which ones in my list are performing well that day, which ones are down. A lot of times I'll go to the ones that are down looking for a nice uh, entry. So I tend to, I actually tend to buy stocks more when they're pulling back than when they're moving up. So I'd rather get them on a pullback than than uh, chasing them on the way up. Uh, sure. also. And then, yeah, you can create your, you know, groups. There's my sector spiders. Uh, there, I mean, I have, there's lots of different things in here. That looks like a, an old one, but there you go. There's your sectors and, and the scooter. You can do all of that, use your search table, but yeah, you're, you're very familiar with your chart list. I mean, you look at those all the time Yep. Um, and you can scan on those still too. And then, you're familiar with the charts because they're in your chart list. That is true. I mean, I keep uh, probably anywhere from 200 to 250, maybe even 300 stocks in there at one time. You keep up to 500 in a chart list, in one chart list. Um, so yeah, I mean, being able to keep the stocks that I like to trade in one list and then either scan against it or use like you share, you're showing on your screen right there, that summary page. And then I just click on that percentage change column Mm -hmm. And so if you've got 500 stocks or 300 stocks, you can quickly, you, yeah, just by clicking that one button, all the ones that are performing really strongly that day come up to the top and you click, click on it again. And yeah, then it highlights the ones that are weak, uh, just like that. So quickly you can see which stocks within your, your watch list are performing well, which ones are not. And uh, for me, that's invaluable to quickly zero in on potential trades. Yep. And here's that results of the what we just went over in the the um, example and look at healthcare. Mo the majority, what two thirds or more, are in the defensive sectors right here. So I think that's very interesting. Whenever my scans start coming up with defensive groups, um, you know that's something to keep in mind. And again, though I know. Um, for me, I am a momentum trader uh, in that I like to already see that positive momentum. So we know that the market has been a little bit touchy uh, lately, so it shouldn't be a complete surprise to get defensive sectors. Correct. All righty. Uh, I am collecting those symbols from the chat room. 
Uh, I am going to close it out, but guys, uh, go ahead and like the symbols there that you might want to see. The most popular in the chat room will be number two. The rest of them will be picked uh, based on if they haven't been looked at for the week uh, or just I, I like the chart or the sector. First one, McDonald's. All right, uh, let's take a look at McDonald's and see what we have here. Um, I'll be a fan. I mean, I'll be uh, honest. I'm not a huge fan of uh, McDonald's in the short term. I think it's a great company longer term. And I think even as a swing trader from a longer term perspective, I mean, I'm talking about maybe uh, six to eight weeks longer term from a trading perspective. That's not really long term for many of you. Um, I'm OK with it. But I just think short term, it's probably run its course. And the reason I say that is here on the chart, you can see that we have been gaining in terms of price, but that PPO has been declining. So as we're moving higher, it's just telling me that price momentum is slowing. And when I look down here at the volume, the volume is kind of saying the same thing. The volume has been very lackluster here as we've been trying to push to new highs. So I actually I put these pink arrows in because when I see a negative divergence, and especially when it's confirmed with just lackluster volume, I start looking for a 50-day test. I look for a centerline reset on the PPO. So this is what I'm looking for to happen. So I'm not looking for any kind of a huge move to the downside, but I would not be surprised to see three, four dollars to the downside on McDonald's back to say 193, 194. Uh, that would be close to where our prior low was here. It also would be at the 50 day, which is 193.50. And that would help take the PPO back down closer to the center line. So I just think short term, I've got some issues. I wouldn't be jumping into it here. I just think that the risk reward doesn't make as much sense. Um, so for me, I would pass on it for now, but I do like McDonald's. I like the space that it's in. I just like it a lot more if we get back closer to a support level. I think the reward to risk would set up a lot better at that point. All right. The most popular in the chat room is Tandem Diabetes, TNDM. Yeah, I like TNDM. I actually put this, uh, I've got three portfolios that I announced over at Earnings Beats a week and a half ago, and this is in my um, aggressive portfolio. I think TNDM still looks strong. We're consolidating, but that's okay. The stock went from, you know, $27 back in November up to 75 in March. So we're talking about over about a four or five month period uh, going from 27 to 75. That's almost tripling. So it's okay to sideways consolidate for a bit. And considering how poorly the healthcare group in general has been doing, I think the stock's holding up uh, really well. So I think if I was annotating here, I would just want to make sure that I hold some of the key areas of support. Now, that's going to be a big one. Um, we saw the volume come in here in mid-April, went all the way back down to 54. So from a longer term perspective, that's the range I would consider. Now, if you want to maybe think about a little bit shorter term, then maybe um, I'm just going to put in here another, oops, another area where we saw some selling recently and it held at about this 59. If I get this thing to work, there we go. Uh, 59 level. And so I think short term, you got some support of 59. I think from the longer term perspective, I'd be looking maybe at 54 support. Range uh, goes all the way up to about 75. I believe ultimately we're going to get a breakout here. So I'm bullish tandem. Um, I just think right now we're in consolidation mode. So you might have to have some patience. All righty. Next up is a biotech XL Lixis. Uh, E-X-E-L. All right. I will say this is the time that these stocks tend to do better historically. When we get into the summer months, June, July, uh, I don't know what it is, but the summertime, maybe it's uh, because they're part of defensive areas. And of course, the market tends to not do as well during the summer. So some of the defensive areas do better. Uh, maybe that's the reason. But what I would say here is we've got a positive divergence in play. So you got declining lows, you've got a higher PPO. So you got positive divergence. So instead of a negative divergence with a reset, instead what I'd be looking for here is maybe a positive divergence and a reset. This doesn't necessarily mean we, we're gonna put in a long-term bottom, but I think we have a shot here to get the PPO back to the zero line. I think testing that 50 day, which is coming back down near this area of what I would expect to be overhead resistance, and maybe even put in another area of overhead resistance, recent highs. 
up here just under 21. So I'm going to say about 2080 up to about 2150. I think that could be an area where it turns back to the downside. Um, but even still, if we get up to 2150 from 2033, you're talking about another five, five and a half percent to the upside. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see that off of this positive divergence. This is another one, too, where the selling on the move to the downside here wasn't very strong, not as strong as we saw uh, during the first move. So I think that uh, lackluster volume to the downside is confirming the positive divergence. I think we're going to get a 50-day test. So EXEL, I like in the short term. Once I got to the 50-day, though, I'd probably be out just waiting to see whether or not we can get a breakout to the upside. All right. Let's see the next one up. Uh, Roku. Love it. I know it's down today. I don't own it right now, but I'm licking my chops. Um, I believe, I don't know if they were downgraded earlier today or not, but the stock has been down all day today, down 5%. Look at this move to the upside, though. Heavy volume supporting it. I think that this is a tremendous stock. And when it pulls back to either price support or that rising 20-day moving average, I will be in it. I'm just waiting it's on my strong earnings chart list. Great report here. Great reaction to the report. And with the overall market struggling in May, look at what Roku's been doing. You got a great relative performer. If I was in it, I'd hold it. And if I'm not in it, I'd, I'd be begging for another uh, 7 or $8 to the downside. Low 80s, I think, would be a great entry here. All right. Our friends in Canada would like to see Toronto Dominion Bank, td.to. All right. I know another thing they'd like to see, which is a Toronto win over Golden State in the NBA <laughs> Finals. That's true. <laughs> uh, good luck with that one, though. I tell you, that's a juggernaut they're facing. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of areas of resistance, and you can see we're failing at the first one right now. doesn't mean that we're not going to get there, but uh, I would probably be a seller. Oh, well, I wouldn't probably. I would be a seller, a technical seller between 76 and a half, 77 and a half, and let's see it get through. So the fact that it's up here battling right now, I'd probably be unloading some shares, uh, just looking maybe for a, another pullback to the downside. Good news is off of this uptrend, you can see the equal highs coming across here. We do have a bullish pattern uh, with a rising lows. So we do have an A, A, B, C, D. Breakout here would be E. Although if we break out above 76 and a half, I think you still have to pay attention to the overhead resistance at uh, from mid-September up near 78. So a breakout above 78 is really what I want to see here. But there are mixed signals. You got some positives. You got some negatives. I personally um, believe price support resistance is the most important part of technical analysis. So I'm going to respect that overhead resistance until we clear it. All right. Next one. Uh, I, I don't know. The symbol reminds me of Superfly, but it's uh, Shutterfly, which is S Fly, S F L Y. Yeah, that's another one. I like the uh, ticker symbol S Fly. Right? Superfly. <laughs> yep. Um, we are getting a little bit of a breakout above the February high. I'd really like to. I love the volume that's come in here off this uptrend and the holding of the 20 day moving average. I'd like to see another one of these, I, I, almost like a breakaway gap or something. Uh, maybe just a gap up to 55 and take off just to kind of put that final nail in the downtrend coffin here, uh, if you will, on Shutterfly. But uh, short term, I do like what's going on. The volume coming in off the bottom, I think, is encouraging, holding the 20-day. So I would just continue to want to see that. Um, so I'm just going to annotate the 20-day test, which was positive there. We bounced. If we get back down there again, I'd like to see it happen. You can see that the last breakout again, another breakout. Look at the volume pick up on that move. So it is starting to display some pretty good characteristics, but um, it has been a laggard for quite a while. So I'm going to be very careful to the downside, make sure I keep my stops in play in case this thing rolls back over. All right. Next one up is going to be Planet Fitness, PLNT. All right. I know this one was on my strong earnings chart list. And uh, actually, I think maybe it still is based on the chart. Uh, I don't remember seeing it recently, but I do like what's going on here with the chart. This may have been earnings related here on this gap down. Um, we held the 50 day, broke out to new highs after that. Look at all these hollow candles. Pretty good volume on those moves. That to me just uh, reeks of accumulation. So I think this is a nice looking chart. I would be uh, 
on the bullish side, I'd be looking for entry. I think best entry, well, you can already see after that big volume move, this is where we opened just above 70. This was our intraday low at about 67 and a half. I think if we were to get back into that zone, that's your best reward to risk entry into the stock. We've got overhead resistance up at about 80 and a half. So that's the range that I would trade for now. I think the stock looks good. A little bit of sideways consolidation wouldn't be a horrible thing. Stock was, what, $45 or something like that back in October. Just recently was over 80. So it's had a good run. Um, I think it's a, a really nice stock. I just like it. I'd like it a little bit um, more on a pullback so that the uh, reward to risk would be a little bit more favorable. All right. Let's see. Number seven will be, or no, it's eight, OGI, or Ghanigram Holdings. Yeah, another one that's uh, had some pretty good volume on these moves to the upside. So I like that. And it's in a market where, you know, we've been uh, pretty bullish, um, at least on a relative basis, this stock's been bullish. Uh, let's uh, maybe just connect these recent bottoms because I think we got a decent trend line that's been building that uh, gives us support near the 50 day moving average, right at about $7. The recent high is going to be your resistance which is up closer to eight and a half. I think in the short term, there was a lot of volume on the selling here. If we get back up to, you know, 830, 840, I think I'd probably sell it and see if we get the breakout. Um, and if we don't, we pull back. I'd be looking closer to this trend line for re-entry. I, I think the stock still looks pretty good, even though the volume was heavier on the selling. We, I don't think we've done anything to really damage the chart technically. So uh, I'm okay with it. I just think as you get closer to that 840 area, um, I would be taking no chances, taking my profits and seeing what happens from there. All right. Next up is a software company, Workday, W-Day. All right. They report after the bell tonight. So good luck if you're holding it. Um, this is a stock breaking out. I expect they're going to have a great report. The question is, have they run too much into earnings? That I can never answer. Um, it really is up to the market. I would look for a couple of things, though. If you do hold into earnings and it gaps up and the high, you know, if you're looking at it 10 minutes into the market, and it gaps up, say, to 225, 230, and that's the high of the day, I would be a little skeptical because look what happened here. See what this did? It gaps up a little bit, prints the high of the day, and then sells off for two days in a row. And look at that volume. So if it gaps up and it can't hold the breakout, that would bother me a little bit. Also, if you gap down, you want to hold some key support levels. So let's pull up first the trend line here, which just kind of draw along here. I think, you know, upper 190s to around 200, I think is fairly important. I think also, also, I think right here, if you look at this area, that was a pretty important top that we finally got through. And then we did come down just a little bit below it. So I think this 193 to 200 area is going to be really important to the downside. But Workday is part of the software space, which has been on fire. They're, they're breaking out the new highs. I suspect their earnings are going to be very strong this afternoon. I just don't know whether that's going to translate into a gap up or whether we've just risen so far. It just needs a pullback. So I like Workday. I would be, you know, I'll see how it reacts after its earnings and then uh, kind of develop a trading strategy after that. All right. Our last one is in the industrial sector, which at this point I wouldn't be touching. Uh, Meritor, M-T-O-R. Yeah, this is one. It's starting to show some strength right where it needed to. So uh, this was a major support level. It's in the industrial machinery area, I believe. And that group has just been bludgeoned. If you look at Meritor, it was actually gapping up with its earnings. Uh, went up, was up 25 and change. I think it's being dragged down by its over, overall group. I don't know that it's a stock, but if it doesn't hold on to support, I wouldn't take any, I, or I wouldn't uh, be trying to provide any excuses for it. This is a major support level at $20. Close below 20 and I'm out. Uh, what you're looking for is a break back up above that 20 day moving average. That would likely signal that the worst is behind you. The volume has not been huge on this stock to the downside. So while the overall group is one that I'd be real careful about, I'm okay with MTOR so long as it holds $20. And what I really want to see is the stock break back up above that 20-day moving average. 
Yeah, that's very interesting support level there. And the PPO is starting to decelerate and turn up. So hmm, maybe I uh, misspoke. Well, I mean, you know, we could always turn back down. I don't think that it's done anything yet to confirm that we've got a bottom, but that is that $20 area has been very strong on MTOR. Absolutely. All right. Well, that does complete the 10 and 10. Here are the symbols that Tom just annotated for us. I will have these up in the Market Watchers Live chart list. Just go to the Articles tab, click on the Market Watchers Live blog, and the link to that live chart list is right there at the top. You can copy uh, Tom's annotations, however you want to do it. All right. Um, I will be right back with the market update after this. Market direction is the single most important thing all investors need to know. Get the advice you need by joining dozens of elite money managers and financial experts, including Steve Forbes, Paul Merriman, Tom McClellan, and Keith Fitzgerald at the Money Show Seattle June 15th and 16th. You'll hear real-time market analysis and learn which stocks, bonds, funds, and commodities you should buy and sell to build a safer, more profitable portfolio. Claim your free pass at seattlemoneyshow.com. All right, it is time for our final market update. Uh, at this point, markets are sitting mostly unchanged right now. Uh, you can see at this point, uh, we've got the Dow up slightly on the positive side, but you know, 0.03%, not talking about a lot. Uh, the S&P is up just about one and a half points right now. NASDAQ uh, is on the rise here. Uh, we can see that it is, let's see, it's a 0.36% to the upside. NYSE, however, is on the negative side, down 0.1%. Russell 2000, small caps, not doing much today either. Uh, TSX, Canadian markets are on the negative side, down almost 12 points, but not by too much. Treasury yields are lower, 2.273% uh, right now, really moving lower. Uh, VIX is sitting right around 16. It's at 16.41. UUP, the dollar, having a great day. You can see a big gap up and continuing higher. So not a surprise to see a gap down, but gold is holding its own right now. May have hit an intraday low. It is moving sideways uh, despite this rise in the dollar going on. I think that's positive. USO is mostly unchanged. Well, it looks like it's up three quarters of a percent, up nine cents. Currently, USO is at 1232. TLT is up 83 cents, reaching 128.61. As far as our sector summary goes, let's get a read. Com service is certainly the big winner, followed by technology, both fairly aggressive groups. Utilities, consumer staples are the laggards right now, both of them down almost 0.9%. Uh, those are defensive sectors. That's all I have right now, Tom. I'm going to pass it back to you. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to take a look at the uh, semiconductors here for a minute. This is an hourly chart on the SMH, goes back four months. And first thing when you're looking at this chart, of course, we have been in a steady downtrend now for quite some time. It's been a painful month for these semiconductors. But down here at this low in March, and remember, this is when we had a lot of volatility uh, back in early March. The SMH dropped down during that, uh, uh, that period of selling down to about the 99 level. And if you look at where we are right now, we're sitting at 99.17, put in a double bottom here just over the last uh, few trading days, two or three trading days. And that mirrors that low back in March. I actually give the semiconductors a pretty good chance here. If they're going to rally, this is a level they want to rally from. If you look at the last two lows here, and in, then even today coming down and testing that low, look at what's going on here with the PPO. We're starting to see the hourly PPO turn higher, even though prices are going lower. I think that's a pretty good sign that maybe a bottom is in. I think the SMH is something that you could trade to keep a very tight stop, and it could turn out to be a major uh, bottom in the overall market. Uh, and the SMH in general as well, because um, historically, the end of May, early June, we are beginning today a 10-day stretch, which goes through basically the end of next week, not quite all the way through the end of next week. But uh, this is a one of the most bullish periods of the year. Historically, I think the um, small cap Russell 2000 has an annualized return of like 65% through June 5th. And um, the NASDAQ has a similar number, might be around 60% for these same days leading up to June 5th. Um, so I think this is an area where you could keep a fairly tight stop 
on the SMH, and I think we could get a bounce from here. So I just wanted to point out the positive divergence on the hourly chart. And if we go in and take a look at the, um, actually, there was another, yeah, here's my daily chart. So here was that March low, which was down to about 99. And here we are testing this level. So maybe it's just a short-term bounce. Maybe we can get to the 20-day. But from where we are right now to the 20-day would be about 7%. So a lot of selling. I'm not, I don't want to you know, completely ignore what's been going on in this group. I think that uh, the market's telling us something. But this is an area where we certainly could see a bounce in some of these semiconductor stocks, something to keep an eye on. All right, we are going to go into the final segment. And what I want to talk about is um, I want to go over the Chart Watchers newsletter for a bit. So, you know, we made some changes recently to the Chart Watchers, and I think they were really, really strong, positive changes for everyone out there. Uh, first of all, the, the Chart Watchers is a free newsletter. So if you're on your, if you just click on the dashboard, you're on your home page, and you go down to the bottom of the screen, all the way to the bottom, you will see a place where you can sign up for the newsletter. It is free. All you do is put your email address in, and you will get this at no charge going forward. Um, it comes out uh, every other weekend now. Um, it was just the, I believe it was the first and third weekends of the month and now we've gone to a weekly format so it's really important that you know that now you're going to get that newsletter every single saturday morning um, every quarter there was one month when we'd have five weekends so literally one quarter year there was one month when we'd have two back-to-back -back weekends without the chart watchers newsletter now it is every weekend so that i think is really important also um where you can subscribe, and there's probably multiple places on the site. But on the articles page, if you click this articles page, look over here on the right side. You've got Chart Watchers, Stock Charts Newsletter. So again, you're going to get this newsletter weekly. All you do is sign up there. And then finally, if you're on the Chart Watchers page itself, there's another link here to sign up to Chart Watchers. So you just sign up here, and you've got to type in your email address, and you will get this newsletter. So what were some of the changes we made? Well, I think Chip Anderson was on here on the show not too long ago, and he talked about uh, this was one of the things I believe that he had discussed. Um, we made some changes because, number one, we have added a number of bloggers um, and a number of commentators to the website that, um, you know, you see a lot of their blogs. You've seen them come on um, uh, Market Watchers Live. We have them on here regularly. You know, um, Mary Ellen McGonigal, who you can see right here, she's on Fridays with me to do what's hot, what's not. She provides um, an analysis every two weeks. So what we've ended up doing is we've broken down all of the commentators into two separate groups. So one week there will be, you know, five or six bloggers that are posting articles on Chart Watchers. The next week it'll be another five or six. So it's constantly giving you different opinions and different things to be thinking about. Um, but all with the background, that technical analysis background. So we're all looking at it from a technical perspective. Some of those that are authoring articles in this newsletter have their own blogs that are behind the paywall. John Murphy, Martin Pring, Arthur Hill. These are folks that have um, articles, but you have to be a member of Stock Charts to see them. Well, on Chart Watchers, you're getting a little bit of a sneak preview to those three authors in particular um, and seeing what they're thinking about the market. So again, another benefit to being a Chart Watcher subscriber. So a couple things I wanted to mention. I'm going to start with my article because I just wrote it over the weekend. And it was called Calling Market Tops is Easier Than You Think. And if you're a short-term trader, one thing I think that we really should be focused on is when the market is telling us signals are giving us signals that tell us we need to be a little bit more cautious. And I'll be honest, I have not used this signal nearly as often as I should. And I'll show you some of the uh, uh, signals that this, sig that this VIX has given us in the past. But I talk about the volatility index. And normally, if you follow the VIX, you know that the VIX and the S&P 500 tend to move opposite one another. And we know this. Because at the bottom of this article, you can see here's a correlation 
VIX and the S&P 500. Over, now, this is a daily chart. It goes back, I don't know, eight months, something like that. But the correlation is based on over the last uh, 20 days. So you take a look at what the VIX has done over 20 days, what the S&P has done uh, uh, over those same 20 days, and then you plot their correlation on a chart between minus one and plus one. And what you will see most of the time is it's almost always at minus one. And the reason being, the market gets much more volatile when stocks are going down. So when the S&P is going down, volatility is going up. When the market is going up, volatility is going down. So therefore, you're going to see that relationship of minus one. But what I noticed in this article when I was writing is that the last move up on the S&P 500 into early May, as we were going higher, the VIX was moving higher. And we actually crossed over into positive correlation territory, which was very odd. And so I thought to myself, well, that's strange. I mean, normally we see the exact opposite. I wonder if we look back in history, if that's something that has happened before. And is this something that is telling us we need to be concerned? And I think it is. In this chart, you can see that the VIX um, started, had a couple periods where it went up a little bit while the market was going up. And look at these pops on the correlation. All of a sudden, going up to zero or just above zero. This goes back three years. So it's not like this is going to be a signal that you're going to get every week. But occasionally, when the market is really bullish and moving higher, we will start to see some positive correlation because the VIX starts rising. And you have to think, OK, what is that telling us? Well, it's telling us that the market's getting more nervous, even though the market is going higher. Normally, the market gets less nervous. It gets complacent as the market goes up. So I think that all of these signals, if you look at what's happened afterwards, it doesn't mean we're going into a bear market. But I think it does tell us that in the near term, the market is vulnerable to a pullback because the fear is building, even though prices continue to move higher. So this was one of the things I thought was worth mentioning in, this, in the newsletter article. I do talk about my own blog, Trading Places, about the VIX quite a bit. I know uh, Aaron, when she talks about sentiment here on Mondays, she talks about the VIX, the equity put call ratio, and another, a, a number of other sentiment indicators. But sentiment is a big part of the market. And I uh, just wanted to point it out. And again, this was just my article as part of this um, newsletter, um, but it works in both directions. So this was an article talking about market tops and how you can use sentiment in terms of the VIX to help spot some possible market tops. I want you to look at a couple of other articles I wrote. This was back in my own blog back on February 7th. And I said, I'll step out on that limb. The bottom is in. And if I pull up the S&P 500 and we go back to February 7th, well, actually, I think February 7th might have been just below, just before this, but we had gone straight down. And that was when my article came out. It wasn't, you know, any kind of... Uh, a premonition that I had. It was simply seeing that the VIX had gotten to a certain level and knowing history when the VIX hits that level, we tend to see the market bounce. And so you can see that drop or that, uh, yeah, the drop followed by a nice bounce afterwards. On December 26th, we put in a bottom. And on December 26th, I wrote an article, we're nearing our first major bear market bottom. And again, it wasn't that I saw the future, it was just simply reading the VIX, knowing that the VIX was getting to a level that normally suggests that we are ready to make a big move to the upside. Um, if you go into my weekend article, I wanna also go over a couple of these other articles that came out because I think the, the information shared in the chart watchers is tremendous value. And especially when you consider you don't even have to pay for it. Um, but if you go into my article from uh, Saturday's chart watchers, or if you go into my article this morning in Trading Places, I'm going to I'm going to be talking a lot more about the volatility index and how it is really important to follow it to spot bottoms and tops. I mean, if you're going to trade in the short term, I don't know how you can do it um, effectively without at least considering what's going on with the volatility index. So if you go in here, I'm going to do a webinar at 4:30 this afternoon with John Hopkins. 
And if you'd like to attend that, it is free. No charge for that either. Just go into my blog, either of those blog articles in Chart Watchers or in today's Trading Places, and you can register for that. Um, but let's take a look at a couple of these other articles. Um, you know, I know Erin talked about the fact that, uh, well, during her workshop, you know, she was showing you some scans. And if you go into the Chart Watchers, and Erin didn't write this past week, but she did write in the following or the uh, previous week, May 17th. And you can see she was sharing her favorite scan using Scooter and the rising P PMO. So, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you hear here on the show, you also hear and read about in the Chart Watchers newsletter. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is that if there's a particular article or a style that you like, for instance, if uh, you read through the uh, Aaron's uh, discussion of her scan and you really like her style, you can go down to the bottom of her article or any of our articles and you can subscribe. So you type in your email address, you subscribe, and as soon as Aaron posts another article in Chart Watchers, it will automatically be sent to your email address. So we can't make it a whole lot easier. I mean, <laughs> it, it's uh, can, can we, Aaron? I don't know. <laughs> we do try. Sometimes it's just, uh, it seems very intuitive to us, but not so much to other people. I think this is, uh, how, how can you not be a subscriber of Chart Watchers and especially uh, Trading Places and the Decision Point blog? <laughs> well, yeah, we're a little biased in that regard. Yes, if you're fans of ours, you certainly should be subscribing to those. I mean, you know, here's Martin Pring. Um, you know, again, he's behind the paywall with his market roundup. But here on Chart Watchers, you can get some of his latest thoughts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know of Martin Pring. We've had him on the show. He's brilliant. And some of his big picture analysis that he does is worth its weight in gold. Yet again, in Chart Watchers, you don't have to pay for it. So this is a no brainer to me um, to sign up for the Chart Watchers newsletter, to get this information on a weekly basis. I know, Aaron, you spend a lot of time, extra time, providing great educational information for folks out there. I do the same. Mm -hmm. Every one of the authors do. And it's worth mentioning that some of those authors that have been on the show here, Julius, um, um, David Keller, Mary Ellen, uh, John Hopkins comes in from Earnings Beats, um, Greg Schnell, uh, all of these, these folks that have been providing a lot of great information are also writing on the Chart Watchers newsletter. So... Anyway, I just wanted to point out, I think it is uh, amazing the uh, work that a lot of folks do here, and it is free, free. Yes, I've learned so much from all of my colleagues. I read them all. I read every one of these articles every weekend. Aw. I do. I, think I it's, appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it's great information, and I like to see what everyone else is thinking, make sure I'm not missing something that somebody else is picking up on. Right. <laughs> anyway, sign up. Here is today's poll. This relates back to our Monday setups. Um, you're winning. A yes, but I do have to, I have to give credit to our producer because I said that I had picked AT&T for the poll. It did end up on my Monday setups, but I picked HTA to add to the poll. So I have first place, but I also have last place. So hey, last pay place hasn't been a bad place to be though. That is very true. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> uh, maybe that'll help me this week. I'm down toward the bottom with my, uh, smart sheet and Chipotle. So yeah, come on, people, vote a little more. We got to put it. Uh, we got to decide which one's first and which one's second. <laughs> so yeah. get in there. <laughs> well, I learned my lesson going with uh, the uh, industrial machinery group last week. So I'm going to go with software, which has been one of the better performing areas. I'll go with Smart Sheet this week. See what happens. Well, there you go. Yep. All right. Uh, well, let's take one final look here at the market before we wrap up. Um, and currently, we do have the Dow Jones down four points. So, wow. Big, yeah. big move. Russell 2000 up three quarters of one point. S&P 500 down 0.13. Uh, you get the picture. Anyhow, I uh, do appreciate everybody stopping by. I want to thank all of you for being with us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It's located below the video player. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays, from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I want to wish everyone a great afternoon. Good luck to those Toronto Raptors. Uh, I don't know if the series starts tonight, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> I'll be back here tomorrow. Happy trading.